Good afternoon, and welcome to the MetaFast fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please note today's event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Scott Van Winkle. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Welcome to MetaFast fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. On the call with me today are Dan Chard, Chief Executive Officer, and Tim Robinson, Chief Financial Officer. By now, everyone should have access to the earnings release for the period ended December 31st, 2019, that went out this afternoon at approximately 4.05 p.m. Eastern Time. If you have not received the release, it is available on the Investor Relations portion of Metafast website at www.metafastinc.com. This call is being webcast, and a replay will be available on the company's website. Before we begin, we would like to remind everyone that the prepared remarks contain forward-looking statements, and management may make additional forward-looking statements in response to your questions. The words believes, expect, anticipate, and other similar expressions generally identify forward-looking statements. These statements do not guarantee future performance, and therefore undue reliance should not be placed upon them. Actual results could differ materially from those projected in any forward-looking statements. MetaFast assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking projections that may be made in today's release or call. All the forward-looking statements contained herein speak only as of the date of this call. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to MetaFast Chief Executive Officer, Dan Chard. Thank you, Scott, and good afternoon to everyone joining us. Thank you, as always, for your interest in MetaFast. I'll start the today's call by giving an overview of our fourth quarter's performance, then Tim will review the financial results in more detail and provide our first quarter and full year 2020 guidance. We'll then both be available to take any questions. We're pleased with a very strong finish to the year, with both revenue and earnings ahead of our guidance. Most importantly, we've seen a solid year-over-year -year growth in the number of active earning Optavia coaches reflecting our ongoing efforts to prioritize the development of our coach base in order to drive an ever-expanding community of clients. In 2019, our community grew to more than 30,000 Optavia coaches and over 500,000 Optavia clients. Our focus on growing our number of clients, which are people who buy our products but do not receive any commission-based payments, is a demonstration of how we continue to redefine the direct selling model. By doing so, we are driving long-term sustainable growth and building value for our shareholders while remaining devoted to our mission of offering the world lifelong transformation, one healthy habit at a time. Our business is at the very heart of health and wellness at the health and wellness industry, now worth a remarkable $230 billion in the United States alone. The weight loss, weight management, and healthy lifestyle out segments of that industry continue to expand and represent a huge addressable market for us, not just at home, but also around the world. We've already established ourselves as a leading player in the market, and we will continue to drive industry share by nurturing and developing Optavia coaches and serving a growing number of clients across the world. 2019 was a transformational year focused on building technology and infrastructure aimed at preparing the company for our future growth objectives while updating our systems to give our coaches and clients the support they need as we drive the business to the next level. Our coaches are at the key of the Optavia difference, with clinical studies proving weight loss and adopting a healthier lifestyle is more approachable and more effective with a human support system. In 2019, we focused on strengthening our coaching community and providing coaches with the vital tools necessary to increase the personal interactions between them and their clients. Again, by building a strong base of coaches, we are expanding our ability to drive an engaged and energized community of clients. And it's our commitment to nurturing and growing that community that makes us stand out in the direct selling segment. As a result of having great products and great support, we were able to exceed our challenging goal of hitting 30,000 coaches in the United States two quarters ahead of schedule. We also made progress with our expansion into Hong Kong and Singapore, 
gateway markets in the greater China and Southeast Asia, and we are encouraged by the initial response. We expect the business to develop over time in these two new markets, just as it has here in the United States, first through client development, and then through the conversion of clients to coaches. This is the cornerstone of our sustainable business model. We continue to expand our product offerings to create SKUs developed specifically for these markets, and we are now seeing a positive response within our target markets. During the second quarter of 2020, we expect to open a distribution center in Hong Kong to support the region and reduce shipping costs. We have completed development of our new mobile app for use worldwide with client management, ordering and meal planning capabilities, as well as the ability to add new languages quickly and effectively as we expand. We have significant initiatives planned for 2020, and we have given ourselves a solid platform for further growth. We have made significant progress in addressing the growing pains we experienced in the third quarter and fourth quarter of last year, and we're confident that these challenges are now behind us. We had seen some impact on coaching client experience caused by migrating to new technology platforms. We've now completed migrating our client-facing mission-critical systems, including those impacting business intelligence, e-commerce, and customer relationship management, and have built a platform that will enable us to scale significantly and expand well beyond our current markets. These migrations were essential as we seek to drive scale and deliver our long-term goal. We are pleased with these implementations. In the supply chain, vastly increased demand meant we needed to dismantle and restructure our existing supply chain operations to allow new systems to come online. This caused some disruption to our coach and client experience, and as we detailed in our last earnings call, this had an adverse impact on our gross profit margin in the third and fourth quarters. We have now established and implemented solutions that give us the capacity and flexibility to support increased demand in the future. I'm pleased to say that these actions have resulted in increased order accuracy and, client, and, and increased client satisfaction. Finally, as we also discussed last quarter, Metafast experienced some issues in the second and third quarters related to a highly organized automated scheme using stolen credit cards to transact business on our e-commerce sites. These activities led to unanticipated negative effects on profitability and distorted our forecasting. I'm pleased to report that the software and new processes implemented in the third quarter have been successful and bad debt levels have returned to historical levels throughout the fourth quarter and we expect this continue into 2020. Our guidance for 2020 reflects a residual impact on our revenue growth trends resulting from the operational challenge I just mentioned. The impact on growth in 2020 is the result of the slowed client and coach attraction in the final two quarters of 2019, which in turn impacted the size of our client and coach bases as we begin 2020. We believe the slowdown in our growth trends is short-term in nature, and we are excited for the additional in initiatives we have in store to support our long-term growth plans. As a management team, we are firm in our belief that we can deliver growth, not just today, but for the long run. As we seek to develop further scale, however, we must, take, we must make sure that we do so in a responsible way that does not adversely impact our fundamentals. Our coaches are one of the key differentials between Optavia and our competitors, and we must maintain a high quality of service if we are to drive term long if we are to drive long term growth that means striking the balance between aggressive revenue targets and ensuring an excellent client experience based on our current capacity we understand an understanding of the demand for our current offering we believe metafast can sustain a highly predictable baseline annual revenue CAGR in the mid teens there's much to be excited about as Meta at metafast as we look forward to 2020 we have recently reorganized our technology operations to support digital technology and client satisfaction to maintain operational excellence as we drive growth. We are now well prepared to launch our new cloud-based enterprise resource planning platform in the second quarter, which is yet another step to setting the stage for, the accommod for accommodating future growth. We are confident in our top-tier partners in our extensive testing, and we expect a smooth implementation and transition. As mentioned earlier, we have also finalized our mobile platform, 
and have plans to launch a beta version in all markets in the second quarter. This platform is aimed at giving our coaches and clients the necessary tools for increasing productivity and enhancing interactions, as well as supporting mobile orders and payments in our new Asian markets. We're excited to announce that we will also add a satellite office to our footprint mid-year in Salt Lake City, which will act as our technology hub to support all of our new technologies we have put in place and have coming online in the near future. We are impressed by the talent in Utah and we are excited to expand our capabilities in this area. Additionally, as I've already mentioned, we expect to open a distribution center in Hong Kong aimed at supporting growth in Asia. Improving, this will improve transit time and improve margins over time, especially through reduced shipping costs as we expand our footprint in the region. We remain, we remain confident in our market opportunity and our ability to execute. These strong fundamentals are the foundation of our competitive advantage and position us for sustainable, profitable growth in the future. We have a strong balance sheet and, class and cash flow to support our growth aspirations, all while returning cash to our shareholders, including an over 50% increase in our dividend during the fourth quarter. We have an incredible group of employees at all levels, dedicated coaches, and a compelling, effective health and wellness program fueled by amazing products that collectively are enabling us to fulfill our mission of offering the world lifelong transformation, one healthy habit at a time. In summary, we are excited to propel this company into the next phase of growth. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Tim. Thank you, Dan, and, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll review the financial resort results for the fourth quarter ended December 31st, 2019. Then I'll provide our first quarter guidance and discuss our 2020 outlook. Revenue in the fourth quarter of 2019 increased 17% to $170.6 million from $145.8 million in the prior year period. We ended the quarter with 31,800 active earning coaches compared to 24,100 in the same period last year and 32,200 exiting the third quarter. Average revenue per active earning coach for the quarter decreased 9.2%. To $5,229 compared to $5,756 for the fourth quarter last year, in line with expectations shared in the last earnings call, they we anticipated pressure on this metric due to the operational headwinds experienced in 2019. We believe we are well into the recovery period and expect average revenue per active earning coach to return to normal levels as 2020 progresses. Optavia branded products grew to 79% of our total company consumable units sold in the fourth quarter, up from 72% in the prior year period. Gross profit for the fourth quarter of 2019 increased 17.4% to $128.1 million, compared to $109.1 million in the prior year period. Gross profit margin as a percentage of net revenue increased 30 basis points to 75.1% versus 74.8% in the fourth quarter of 2018. The improved gross margin reflects our mid-year price increase and reductions in cost-related inventory obsolescence, partially offset by customer concessions. SG&A in the fourth quarter of 2019 increased 20.1 million to 109.4 million compared to 89.3 million for the fourth quarter of 2018. The increase is primarily a result of higher up to be a commission's expense, temporary elevated consulting costs related to technology initiatives to support the growth of the business, and increased salaries and benefits. Our effective tax rate was a 4.7% benefit in the fourth quarter of 2019, compared to a 22.4% expense in the fourth quarter of 2018. The fourth quarter tax benefit was a result of discrete federal tax benefits from share-based compensation partially offset by increases in the effective state tax rate of approximately 2%. Net income in the fourth quarter of 2019 was $19.9 million, or $1.66 per diluted share, based on approximately 11.9 million shares outstanding. The street federal tax benefit from share-based compensation had a $5.7 million impact on net income in the fourth quarter, or 47 cents per diluted share. This compares to fourth quarter 2018 net income of $15.7 million, or $1.30 per diluted share, based on approximately 12 million shares outstanding. 
Our balance sheet remains very strong with stockholders' equity of $104.8 million and working capital of $74.8 million as of December 31st, 2019. Cash, cash equivalents and investment securities as of December 31st, 2019 decreased $8.3 million to $92.7 million compared to $101 million at December 31st, 2018. The company remains free of interest-bearing debt. Inventory increased $9.9 million to $48.8 million as of December 31st, 2019, compared to $38.9 million at December 31st, 2018. The increases related to inventory investment to support the growth of the business, including the introduction of approximately 32 SKUs related to our Asian expansion in 2019, the initial production of the new Habit to Health system, and continued efforts to maintain inventory levels to meet current and future demand. Our board of directors declared a quarterly cash dividend in the fourth quarter of $13.4 million, or $1.13 per share, which was paid on February 6th. As Dan noted, this reflected approximately a 51% increase in the quarterly dividend. During the fourth quarter, the company did not repurchase any additional shares, leaving approximately 2,369,000 shares of common stock remaining under our share repurchase program. Now turning to our guidance. We expect first quarter revenue to be in the range of $166 to $171 million, and EPS to be in the range of $1.35 to $1.42. For the full year 2020, we expect revenue in the range of $715 to $745 million, and EPS to be in the range of $6.25 to $6.55. Our fiscal year 2020 guidance assumes a 22.5 the 23.5 effective tax rate. As we've discussed, 2019 provided some operational challenges that we believe are now largely behind us. Dan noted these challenges temporarily muted coach and client attraction. Our guidance reflects the time we expect it to take to regain momentum. Our full year guidance reflects steady improvement as the year progresses and a full year rate of growth that will meet or exceed industry growth expectations. We executed effectively through some challenges in 2019 and ended the year in a strong financial position. And we believe strongly in the business that we have worked very hard to build. That concludes our operational and financial overview. We appreciate your interest in Metafast, and Dan and I are now available to take your questions. Operator? We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then 2. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Steph Wisink with Jefferies. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dan, if I could just start with a question for you on the sequential trend. You know, usually we see a nice sequential boost Q4 to Q1 just given the seasonal effect of the category. Can you talk a little bit about the conservatism in your guidance, what you're seeing quarter to date that would lead you to kind of guide to a flat to even down slightly sequential pattern in your revenue? Yeah, thanks, Steph. I, I think it's probably easiest to kind of go back and, and revisit, you know, what, what we talked about last last uh, last year or last um, the core call, and then talk about how that applies. So. If you look at it, our coaches perform four things, four competencies. They attract clients, support clients, sponsor new coaches, and develop coaches. In the back half of 2019, we forced them to spend less time doing that, and consider those the high-value tasks, to support dissatisfied clients. So think about that as answering client complaints, helping them with returns, all the things we talked about in the fourth quarter. The, uh, the specific disruptions that uh, were impacted, and I'll give you a little bit more kind of color on these, um, that you know, we had from a talk technology standpoint, we identified in the back half moving into the fourth quarter, 218 items um, that, were, that, were, uh, that needed to be fixed. So think about those as kind of small things. Uh, some might be a sale on a report that was inaccurate or a uh, button that is clicked twice um, gives a, uh, a mess, an error message. So that was the technology piece. In our supply chain, we were in the process of 
in, in, increasing our overall capacity by 40%. And so in supply chain, we saw a 95% increase in client, client complaints in the back half. And then you're aware of the credit card payments. We had uh, $2.8 million in bad debt. So those, all those things were disrupted to the coaches and distracted them from performing those two top uh, highest value added activities, attracting clients and supporting clients. So, you know, when we, when we think about how we um, measure the disruption, it, uh, we saw a 34% decline in the growth rate of client acquisition. So 34% fewer cl new clients coming in. That moderated in the fourth quarter to 8% as we implemented the changes. If you looked at co-sponsoring, in the third quarter, we saw a 25% decline in the growth rate, um, and that moderated to 17% uh, in the fourth quarter. In the fourth quarter, we also uh, said that, uh, that we would make fixes to all three of these areas. So I wanted to share with you um, what those fixes have resulted in. On the supply chain side, complaints are now down to 74% are down, down uh, at the end of 2019. In fact, January 2020 represents the lowest complaint rate that we've had uh, for the previous 12 months, so a, a new low point. So that confirms that we uh, have fixed those supply chain issues that were challenges and headwinds to us in the fourth quarter, in third and fourth quarter. On the technology side, um, all 218 identified technology items, items were fixed through four releases in the fourth quarter. So all the work that's currently being done, now, do, being done now is to improve uh, user experience moving from good to excellent. Uh, but we're back to where we were during our high growth rates. From a credit card payment standpoint, uh, we have software in place and processes that have changed and our bad debt levels are back to where they've been uh, in terms of historical norms. So more specifically to your question, what that means for 2020 and how we guide it. Our two key metrics that drive growth were impacted by these numbers, so new client acquisition and coach sponsoring. So the impact uh, is on the proportion of new clients to existing. So think about new clients and new coaches as being the most active portion of, uh, of our business building uh, engine, if you will. New clients are the ones who are just coming in on the five-in-one plan, and they have a higher spend level, so they drive up productivity per active earning coach, one of our the key metrics that we share with you. If you think about new coaches, they're the ones who are most active in bringing in new clients. So those are the two groups that were impacted by the disruption. So we're going into 2020 with fewer new clients as a ratio to existing and fewer new coaches as a ratio to existing. So those are the two things that have caused us to guide down for the first quarter and uh, then, you know, what we anticipate is, just, is those, those, uh, those ratios turn back to where they normally are and where they normally uh, have been historically during our uh, times of growth. We'll start to see the growth return as our business returns to normal uh, without our coaches facing these uh, operational disruptions that uh, we experienced in the back half of last year. Okay, that's helpful. And then a second part to that question is just understanding a little bit about what the key measures are that you're looking for. So you just walked through a number of performance indicators that suggest the trend line is improving. But what should we look for in terms of the P&L to suggest that, you know, again, looking at Q4 versus Q1 as a measurement, even on flat sales, it looks like your earnings are going to be down quite a bit quarter to quarter. So maybe talk a little bit about the earnings profile as you expand through the year, improve the business. Should we also expect the incremental margins to expand again? Yeah, hi, Steph. It's Tim. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. So, you know, when you think about the first quarter, um, you know, we have a higher cost base than entering last year. Um, and uh, we have a, our ERP implementation takes place in the second quarter. So that, that cost year over year uh, will be lower. But, we'll, but we didn't have much cost in the first quarter of last year, and we have the cost hitting the first quarter of this year. We're also going through a process really to kind of adjust our spending levels based on our our, uh, our guidance to make sure that we increase our operating margin year over year at the uh, at the suggested uh, guidance range. So we finished the year last year at about 12.8 percent uh, operating margin. Um, you know we're targeting to be in the, in the range of 13.5 percent for 2020. So 
we will be able to adjust our, our SG&A. We also expect some improvements in our gross margin year over year. We had a lot of pressure on our gross margin in 2019, as we talked about in the last two earnings calls, just related to these disruptions with the cost of expedited shipping, the cost of a customer concession. With that behind us, uh, we won't have that downward pressure on gross margins in, in 2020. Okay, final two for us. One is just level of conservatism in your guidance. If we look at Q4 as a proxy, uh, you substantially beat the guidance that you had provided um, just you know, several weeks ago. So maybe talk a bit about how you formulated your guidance for earnings for the year and the level of conservatism. If we should think about that similarly to what you just delivered. And then last one, just on capital allocation. Um, you know, the stock has been highly volatile. Where does it get attractive to you to start putting some of the balance sheet capital to work um, to support the equity? Thank you. Uh, sure. So on, on, the, on the latter question kind of first, look, our, our ability to buy stock depends on a lot of things uh, in addition to our desire. So as, as you know, in the fourth quarter, Engage Capital filed a 13D. And uh, on the advice of counsel, we did, did not repurchase shares uh, during the quarter. We, we would, of course, we would love to buy back shares at the price that it was at. So to answer your, your follow-up question to that, you know, the, the price was very attractive. So we, our, our reason we didn't buy back shares had nothing to do with our desire uh, to repurchase. Um, I apologize. Now I slipped on the first question. I'm sorry, Seth, Seth Just, could you repeat the first question? Sure. Just wanting to understand a little bit of the conservatism in your EPS guidance for the year and kind of what the key assumptions were to, to get to the guidance level. Sure. So, you know, we had, uh, we had a, a nice uh, tailwind behind us in the fourth quarter from a tax perspective. We, we called out in our release and in our scripts that we had about a $0.47 cent per share benefit uh, in, uh, related to uh, stock windfall uh, impact on our income taxes. So. Uh, b based on where the share prices were granted and based on where they vested, um, you, you get a tax deduction for the full market value of the stock when it uh, when it vests. That no longer applies to future grants. The IRS has changed the tax laws, but we were beneficiary of or grandfathered for a grant that was uh, based several years ago. So without that, so uh, you know, if you look at our EPS, uh, we we were uh, uh, about 47 cents higher. But even without that, we would have beat our guidance range but our gut, we would have beat it proportionally to revenue. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Doug Lane with Lane Research. Please go ahead. Hi, yeah, just to, um, to, to, to piggyback on, on Steph's question, I'm just wondering, and I know, Dan, you mentioned a lot of things as far as your forecasting is concerned, but back in November, you're still looking for a billion in revenue in 2021. Obviously, we're not going to get there. You delivered on the top line in both coaches and revenue in the fourth quarter. So what, what were the two or three key learnings between November and now that got you more cautious on your growth prospects for the next two years? I think as the, uh, as the year, uh, you know, the th last three months uh, transpired, we took a very close look into exactly how um, our coaches and our clients had been impacted by the uh, operational challenges that they faced. Um, allow us to look more closely at uh, how we, what we were doing to improve and, and assess, uh, you know, how quickly things would get back to to normal. So we we think, Doug, that we're back to normal from a standpoint of coach and client experience being uh, what it was during our high, high growth um, periods. What is, what is different and what always takes just a, you know, a little bit of time to, uh, to recreate is uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is that uh, proportion of new people coming in, both in forms of coaches and clients versus uh, existing. So that takes place as uh, the sponsoring of new, new coaches gets back to normal and the attraction of, of new clients gets back to normal. So there's nothing that we see that uh, prevents that from happening. It just, uh, it just is, is taking a, a much larger base than we've had in the past and getting that uh, ratio to return to uh, where it needs to be to show those, uh, uh, those, those rates of, of client acquisition and uh, coach sponsoring to get those back to where they have been. Now, if you, I mean, you, your active coaches in 
the December quarter were better than what I have, but it sounds like maybe there's going to be fallout in the first and second quarter where we could see that number actually go down sequentially. I mean, we, we, we don't guide to the uh, number of active coaches, but, um, you know, coaches, uh, active earning coaches typically, uh, you know, are correlated uh, for obvious reasons with uh, the growth of the revenue. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll see, you know, based on those, some, those same two things, you know, th th that I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to bring in, our current coaches need to bring in new clients and a portion of those new clients uh, will become coaches, and a portion of those uh, coaches go on to be business leaders, and, and uh, they bring in uh, new coaches as well as the, the coaches, other coaches, the new coaches bringing in new clients. So that's that's how the business builds. Um, the the slowdown that uh, we've projected that you're you're pointing out is really related to that uh, that ratio of of new coming in. Uh, versus the existing being there. So our, our, our existing coaches are what will get us back uh, on track to the, uh, the, what, the growth we've seen um, in the past, um, and uh, that will happen throughout the year, quarter by quarter. And as that okay. growth happens, obviously clients, I mean, it starts with clients increasing. So the, the number, we, we derive over 90% of our revenue from clients. Um, and so it's about coaches bringing in new clients and a portion of those clients becoming coaches. So that's, that's what we look for to get uh, our growth engine uh, back. And I guess what, what remains uncertain is the timing of that. Do you have any um, examples or in your experience, what, what, how long do you think this reset, if you will, will be, and how long before you think things will get back to normal now that you fixed the issues that caused this, right, the service issues, the ERP, and certainly the, the credit card issue was a distraction, but is there any anything that you can point to as, as to the timing of a recovery of the kind of growth you're looking for, um, you know, looking for, I guess, doubling the business now every four to five years, um, that kind of pace? Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, back to the first part of your question, what, what have we seen in the past? Um, you know, when we when we st when we put together the the right uh, mix of products and programs and support uh, in, in going into 2017, um, that's when we started to see the growth happening, and that happened because a lot of new clients were coming in, and a lot of those new clients were becoming coaches. So. If you think about uh, 16 to 17 and then 17 to 18, that's uh, that's where we saw the uh, the business begin to grow. I don't think, um, and, and this is um, you know was clear in, in the uh, the earlier script. Um, we we believe that uh, our growth rate to the point you made is, is going to be more in the mid-teens um, rather than in the 20 to 25 percent range, largely because we're a bigger business now. And uh, with our increased understanding of how we best support and the coaches and the training system, uh, we view ourselves as a long-term grower uh, in the mid-teens. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Linda Boltonweiser with DA Davison. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, I know that in the modeling process in the past, you had always said you thought about it, um, productivity kind of being flat going forward, just to assume that. Um, do you suggest we do that in our models now, or do you think that uh, revenue per active coach, you know, is going to kind of invert up, or do you think we should just assume flat going forward? Can you just give a little color on that? Sure, hi, Linda. Yeah, I think we, we, we expect to see it start to build again. As, as Dan mentioned, productivity uh, comes from really two things, the number of clients that you're supporting and the value of each client. And new clients are the most valuable clients from a, an average revenue per month perspective. So as new clients come in, coaches start, start to spend more of their time on those more valuable things as opposed to supporting customer 
issues, they start spending time more on coaching clients and developing clients into coaches that will start to see that productivity move back up. Um, so as we've modeled it right now, you know, you can see we finished the last quarter at about, uh, uh, about 5200 uh, a little more than $5,200, and we had gotten as high as 5800 We wouldn't expect it's going to move back to 5800 quickly, but we do think it'll start moving in that direction throughout 2020. Thanks. And then, um, I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning of the call, so I didn't hear your whole commentary, but um, is the is the international launch kind of going as you would expect, or is it a little slower to ramp than you had thought? And it, should we be thinking about next markets at some point internationally, or is that kind of put on hold at the moment? Thanks. Um, I think two answers to that question. One is uh, the the growth is happening the way we would expect in terms of the metrics showing that uh, clients come on and spend uh, and stay um, in the way we would expect them uh, to, to to stay. And the the, the client to coach conversion is um, actually a little bit higher than what we see in the United States. So that's but it's a, it's a new market and lower numbers. So that part of the international expansion has gone as expected. Um, as you can imagine, uh, you know we, we picked uh, Hong Kong as an example um, as a gateway market to Greater China, um, and almost immediately, um, you know, we were dealing with the political unrest, which had a um, you know certainly a, a headwind, and now we're you know faced with um, as well the the uh, the virus scares. So that's been a challenge, uh, even including uh, Southeast Asia. But we, we view those as, as short-term impact, and certainly because those two markets are still small relative to the size of the United States, uh, we didn't call those out because we don't think they're, um, they're having, they don't have a material impact on, uh, on the, the quarter or nor will they have a material impact on next year. In terms of like how we view this, um, we continue to work kind of on uh, think, think about it as looking forward uh, three to five years in terms of how we plan um, our initiatives, uh, including investment in technology and uh, including uh, our expansion plan. So we continue to believe that uh, international will be a very important part of our business long term and uh, and continue to uh, to assess uh, how to best do that and uh, where we go and uh, when we open those new markets. But at this point, we don't have anything to announce related to that. Okay, thanks very much. Our next question comes from Bill Baker with GARP Research. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, GARP Research. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, get a sense. I know you you addressed a lot of what I was going to ask, but uh, let me just pick one thing here: is the uh, GNA expense, which was uh, fairly high in the second half of 19, and obviously you're guiding for it to, you know, recede halfway in the first quarter and uh, <clears throat> continue for the rest of the year if you kind of work through the uh, top and bottom line. Uh, guidance. Um, can you give us a little better sense of how uh, is that in a, driven by commissions of the older reps versus the newer reps being paid at different rates, or is it extra expenses from ERP or fixing uh, the supply chain? What, what's really driving that ratio, and, and how does it mend itself as the quarters progress in 2020? Sure, hi Bill. Um, so first, just from a seasonality perspective, um, where, where our year kind of goes, right, is, is we have higher spend in the back year uh, than we do in the front of the year, primarily related to two of our, um, our uh, events that take place. Our convention in July each year, um, Last year we had uh, you know, about 10,000 people there, so pretty big event. Um, we also have something called our International Leadership Advancement Trip, which is a, a recognition and training event that gets expensed in the back half of the year, the third and fourth quarter evenly. Uh, the event takes place in the, in the, the following year. 
So we always have a high amount of spend in Q3 and Q4. What was unique about this year is that in Q4, we've been implementing a new ERP initiative, uh, which uh, we said we'd spend you know, approximately $7 million in, in uh, 2019. Uh, we spent a, a slightly in excess of $7 million last year. And in 2019, that was all flowed through directly to expense. There was no capitalization of the, the implementation based on the accounting rules in place for 2019. The accounting rules that are going in place for 2020 do allow you to capitalize that. And while we expect to spend about $2.5 million in 2020, uh, it'll, it'll only about $500,000 will actually hit the, uh, the, the P&L in 2020. So we'll get some leverage there uh, for sure. That, so think of that as kind of a one-time expense hitting last year that will benefit us for, for a long time. A couple other areas, uh, you know, <coughs> from a headcount perspective, you know, we have increased uh, our employee base to support clients and our distribution centers to support growth. So labor on a year-over-year -year basis uh, is also a, an item to point out as far as, as, far as an increase. And uh, they're, they're largely the key items. The rest is variable. So when you think of commissions, that's our largest expense, SGN expense, and it's, it's, it's really completely variable with, with the business. So that, of course, would, would grow as the business grows, but we, we view the percentage of commission to be about the same. And uh, how we pay compensation really uh, it, it doesn't have to do with your tenure. It has to do with your activities. So, uh, so we kind of think that will be somewhat consistent year over year. Uh, other items of variability are, are things like uh, shipping and things like uh, transactional fees, cre transactional credit card fees. Um, uh, and uh, our, our call center is an outsourced operation, um, so that is somewhat variable as well as the call volume fluctuates. So ho hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Mr. Chard for any closing remarks. Thank you, operator, and thank you all for uh, your interest in MetaFast. We appreciate all your participation in today's call, and Tim and I look forward to speaking to you again next quarter. Thank you. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.